one week later, and I just said I may postpone for one week. Uh, so that's why you want to come to the class. <laughs> okay, so um, now we talk about this so-called incomplete ionization. So what happened? So when we take our device physics class, we say I dope one e eighteen of the dopant, right? For example, I for example here I uh, have a MOSFET, and then I have M plus M plus. And then I have a P substrate. For example, I say I took 1E17, e for example. 1E17 e means per cm cube, right? Every cm cube, I have 1E17, e 10 to the power 17 of the impurities, for example, boron. And we assume that they are all uh, activated. Activator means that they are all in the latter sites. Remember the video I got from Global Foundry or something during annealing? The Dopant will substitute the silicon and then they become activated. But yeah, even you're activated, does it mean that they will be ionized? It doesn't mean that. For example, if we look at the, uh, we don't need to draw a new figure, just look at this one. Here I show a conduction band and valence band of the silicon. And you actually, for each of the dopant, they have a finite distance, their, active, uh, their, their energy level is not right at the conduction band. It is very small, actually. For example, I forgot the exact value, maybe phosphorus is how many? 50, 45? So, so I've, I don't have the number with me, so I would just say, for example, approximately, let's say, 45 milli EV. Please double check, milli EV. Right, so 1045 that divided by 1000 electron volt. So there's a finite energy. What is the thermal energy at 3000, 300 Kelvin? Yeah. Right, so you compare to KT over Q, which is about 26 MeV or 25 MeV. So it actually, this is not small, it is pretty large, right? So uh, usually we'll say, when I have 1E17 of boron, then I assume I have 1E17 of hole, okay? Now, so here I'm boron, but here I talk about phosphorus, right? So it becomes electron, right? So on this graph by uh, Automat, right? This is a pretty famous paper. They have a model. This is the doping density. You may have 10 to the power 15, then 100% of them are ionized. But when you start increasing the doping density, actually only 70% or 80% of them are ionized. So what does it mean? I have 1E17 of boron. I was hoping that I get 1E17, let's say here, of boron, but no, you only get about 9.5 E16 of boron. If I keep increasing the doping to, let's say, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5 E18, let's say it's arsenic, I only get about 65% of them ionized. Not all of them are ionized. It, and this is at 300 Kelvin. And the reason is just because it has a finite distance to the conduction band. And this is the so-called incomplete ionization. Okay. Why? We'll go to the equation. Good question. Why, right? That is governed by the thermal st the, uh, the the statistics, the the carrier distribution statistics. Yeah, that's a good question. But before we asking why it goes down, then you might be you feel funny. Then why it goes up again when you have a very high uh, level of concentration? And that is because, think about that, when I have a lot of dopant, now actually your material is changing. You actually becomes more and more like a phosphorus. Of course, it's not really that high because the concentration of uh, atom is what? It's like about 5E23, uh, 5 times 10 to the power 23. Here is still in the order of 5E20. So it's talking about still every 1,000 silicon, you have one impurity. But that is pretty high already. And what, what happened is that 
This is not really that it ionized to the conduction band. It is that your atoms become so close to each other, it forms an impurity band itself. It even doesn't need to go to the conduction band for conduction. The atoms, uh, the electrons on this atom will just hop from one side to another side. Because you are so close, they can hop through tunneling. Yeah. Dopamine is the iron. Yeah. Maybe let's look at this, right? So, yeah. C can you continue to ask your question? This is a uh huh. This is a simple picture. Let's think about this phosphorus, right? So I treat phosphorus as a positive charge, iron, and then you give out an electron. So this electron only ionize if you have enough energy to go to the conduction band. Now, if I have many phosphors, they're close to each other, even you don't have the energy to ionize to the conduction band of silicon, crystal as a whole, it can still jump from one side to another side through tunneling. So this is the impurity band. Can jump from no, not as an atom, think about this. No, this is, uh, what do you call? This is a three-dimensional, right? So I'm talking about one atom per 1,000 silicon, right? So you need to take oh, the cube oh, root. Okay. So it's like about 10 atoms yeah. in one direct direction. Uh, yeah. No, uh, once you put the dopen into your silicon and it substitute a silicon, then we say it is activated. But activated doesn't mean that you are able to ionize your electron. Your electron need to have enough energy to go to the conduction band, right? Or just in this classical model, you need, still need to have enough energy to uh, tear the electron away from the phosphorus. There is the energy you need, yeah. Yeah, so if it's not activated, you might be in the substitutional sites, then it's even more difficult to take away the electron. Yeah. Not substitute, I mean interstitial site. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, and that is called activation. Yeah. So if you're, you want the dopant to go into the lattice point, that you substitute the host atom that's called activation. But even with activation, you might not have electron or holes because that depends on ionization energy of your electron and hole. Right? If you don't activate it, just like you do the implantation, the, select the atom sitting as an interstitial or a whatever, yeah. then you even then it becomes just a pure defect that you it's very difficult to ionize it. Okay? So even you hundred percent Activate it means they are all in the substitutional site. It doesn't mean that 100% of the electron can be ionized just because of this energy gap. Okay, so uh, let, let's move forward a little bit. Uh, now, so with this one, it is just like that. Then how can I ionize it, right? So if you don't have electric field, you just completely rely on the activation energy. Right? But however, there are two ways to uh, enhance the ionization. One is the field dependence model. Under very strong electric field, your electron is here. Originally, I need to go through this large barrier in order to ionize it. Because again, it's just like a well thing about a hydrogen atom. You want to ionize the electron. It's actually just a potential well. You need to supply 13.3 E. 13.6 EV to ionize to the vacuum, right, from atomic physics. This is just the same. You just need to have an atom in this host environment. Right here, I need 45 minute EV to ionize it. Very tiny, but still you need some energy to ionize it. And this is just like a well. Now, if I apply this under a high electric field, then in a certain direction, 
you the, or the direction of the electric field, you actually lower the barrier. So we don't try to solve this, but if you try to just put the potential together, you will see that, right? Because electric field will create a potential in a certain direction. So then you will jump over easily, right? So that is the field enhanced ionization. That is the first thing. So this one, because now it's lower, so this is field enhanced ionization. Then think about this. If it were 45 minute EV, maybe now it reduced to 20 minute EV. Maybe, right? Just an example. Another thing is that now you see that I actually have a very small barrier because of this field. If there's no field, the barrier is very wide. I need to jump out of this potential well. Now it is possibly possible for me to do tunneling. Okay? And that is another way to help me to ionize the electron, right? So this one, the field enhanced ionization, very often we call it Pufanko. Uh, effect under this uh, large electric field. Okay, so there are many things, right? I know that there are many, many things, but uh, we will understand better as we go on. But now I just, in summary, what we have done, what do we have done? I tell you that ionization energy is not zero. So do not expect all of them will get ionized, right? Why? We go to the physics more, but now you understand just because there's a gap, not all the electron can go through just by thermostatics, thermodynamic or uh, the statistics. Okay, that's first thing. Second, under electric field, I can ionize it easily, easier because I can have this Pufanko uh, enhanced effect that lowers the barrier, or through the tunneling, I can have two effects. Right. So electric field can help me to ionize it. That is second thing, right? And of course, if you have higher to uh, temperature, I also will be able to ionize it better, right? So is that okay? And then now I would like to tell, uh, right, to do the de derive how much can be ionized based on the Fermi statistics, okay? So here, for example, right? For example, maybe our doping is 1E18. And then the amount of ionized dopant, ND is the ionized dopant, may be only 8E17. Right? So 20% of them did not get ionized. And this is the equation. Um, how do we understand this? Think about this. This is also just the state. So if you try to go through the Fermi direct statistics. You need to fill up this state also, and also fill up the conduction band at the same time. And then it need to follow the Fermi direct st uh, statistic that we learned earlier. When you are far away from the Fermi level, you have lower occupation. When you are below it, you have higher occupation. But at the same time, the total electron occupying in the condition band and this local state that open are should be summed to be 1E18. So I start with 1E18 electrons because I have 1E18 donor, right? So some of them will ionize to the condition band. Some will not, some will stay in the localized state. They need to add together to be 1E18. Okay, we will derive this in the next uh, slide. But this is the equation. G is something called degeneracy factor. We won't go to the details. You just take it for granted. It can be two, uh, depends on, I forgot what they use, one half or two. Uh, but this is uh, something uh, related to the statistics, uh, degeneration factor, right? Or degeneracy, I think. Right, so uh, no worry about this, but you just be careful for different type of uh, dopant, right? They have different D, different G. 
Uh, Fermi level is the EF, ET is the trap level. So here, uh, my, uh, this is the ET, right? This is the level, the exact level. So ET equals to EC minus ED. ED is the 45 minute EV I gave you earlier, right? So this is the ED, and then this minus this becomes the trap level. Okay, it follow this equation. So we will derive this. Uh, try your best to understand it, but you definitely need to do it in your assignment or uh, uh, exam, right? But just need to understand this equation. I don't expect you to derive it, but I hope you have a feeling about this. Now, why this is so important? Because temperature come into the, a role also into the play also. So we say 300 Kelvin, you might have as le least as 65% of ionized open. But what if it is a 4 Kelvin, 3 Kelvin? You will find that it goes to 10 to the power 6, 10 to the power 10 of ionized open. We will show you later, right? So, yeah. That is the fabrication muscle. So what he's saying that when you do implantation, you do annealing, which you bring it to thousand, maybe a few hundred up to 1100 degrees C. At that process, you do the so-called activation, bring the substitution atom into the silicon site. That is the process. But there's nothing to do with the ionization, right? But what we're talking about is ionization. Now you cool down your silicon, you are selling your chip, right? And then now you put it in free Kelvin or put it at room temperature. Amount of electron got ionized will be different. You still have the same amount of activated dopant. It's just like all these are ready to contribute electron. But unfortunately, you cool it down, many of them just don't have enough energy to put the electron to the conduction band. Yeah. Another important thing is this one. This activation energy. Uh, this is an empirical model. If you do TCAS simulation, you will use this. Basically, this is nice talking about uh, the activation energy at just an extrapolation at low concentration. How about we say that? Right? So this is the pure activation energy, right? If you only have an atom, something like that. If you increase the doping concentration, the effective activation energy will reduce. Now, so this is like, you can think about that, eventually it becomes zero, you just form a, an impurity band, right? So this is starting getting classical, right? Yeah, it is a very quantum mechanical. This states, how can you distinguish the states due to the phosphorus and the state due to the silicon? Right? Only when you have very low concentration of phosphorus, you, could you say that uh, the, this is the state due to the phosphorus. But once you have a high concentration, it's just a whole system. Right? You solve the Schrodinger equation, then they just mix up. So this is pretty classical. So uh, if you feel confusing, just think in this way. Right? So now I don't care about the so-called uh, impurity band. All I want care is that when I have a larger concentration, I will have lower activation energy, so I can ionize more. Okay, so that is one way to think about that. Let's go through the derivation, okay? Uh, I want to derive it. First of all, Fermi statistics. Fermi derived statistics. The probability, right, of occup occupying a state follows the Fermi statistics. Fermi derived statistics, so I'm going to call it uh, FD trap. This is for the a state in the trap, I should say that, sorry. Right, so this is equals to, you see everything is the same as what we learned earlier. Exponential EF minus ET divided by KT minus one. This is the Fermi derived statistic, but except that the general energy becomes ET because we're talking about the probability of, of occupying the trap state. Is that okay? In the past, I gave you is just the E, right? Remember, I gave you uh, this plot. This is the probability, and this is the E, and then you have something like this, 
and then this is the EF. Right, so in the past we said for each energy level we have a certain uh, probability which is which follow the Fermi Dirac statistics. Now for the trap, you also need to multiply the first factor by one over g, which is the degeneracy. And this is understandable because your trap might have many possible states. Right? You might be, need to fill up two or four electrons in order to make it feel full, right? So uh, Kittel's book I just gave you uh, has a good explanation, I mean, as an exercise. Uh, but not that book, it is the thermophysics book. What is that book? The blue one. Thermodynamic. Huh? Yeah. yeah, they have, a, I remember, <laughs> they have an exercise about this uh, trap occupation, right? This all comes from... Uh, statistical uh, mechanics. But anyway, don't worry, just take it for granted, right? And understand why, because this is talking about the trap. It's not a single state, okay? So this is the probability occupying that, right? Now then, as I said earlier, ND0 is the total dopen. ND0 is the total dopen. Right? I put so much phosphorus into it. This ND0 times FD of T, total dopant times FD of T, what does it mean? I have so many dopant times the probability they got occupied, it means what? This is the number of electron, yes, but on, how do you say? Not ionized, not. This is the key word, right? Because it's still in the trap, not ionized. Okay, do you agree? Now, then this is equal to what? Of course, it's equal to the total dopant, ND0, subtract whatever has been ionized, right? So this is the conduction band, this is the number of ionized, right? Ionized means in conduction band, okay? And then how about, uh, we can just plug in or just continue, or, uh, yeah? So we just plug in this, then it means on the left-hand side, it is ND0, Divided by, I just copied that equation, I right? FDT, 1 over G, exponent EF minus ET, divided by KT minus 1. The whole thing equal to ND0 minus ND, right? And then my goal is just to find out the relationship between ND and ND0, because I want to know how much ND got, how much electron got ionized, which is ND, right? So I just rearrange the term, right? I put ND to the left, and then put this whole term to the right. Then I have ND equals to ND0, this whole thing, one minus one over the whole exponents. I try not to write it, right? So I have this ND on the and this side, I put it to the left, and I put this whole thing to the right, and they both have ND0, I factorize it, so this ND0 is one, and then minus this whole thing, right? And you go through the math. You just go through the math. I don't want to spend time here. This is the equation we got from the last slide. E, F, minus ET divided by KT plus one. Okay, I just, uh, I don't need you to be able to derive this, but here I tell, some, tell you something very important. Why some get ionized, some does not, it's just the statistics me mechanics. Because you have trap here, you also have trap, I mean, you have states in the trap, you also have states in the conduction band. You cannot say, why it does, if it's all ionized, then it means all your traps are empty. And that does not follow the Fermi-Dirac statistic because you need to occupy it with some probability. 
So you must need you need to adjust the Fermi level so that they occupy the total occupation will sum to the total available number of electron. Right? You have ten electron, then maybe you have two in the trap and then eight in the conduction band. Right? You cannot have zero in the trap and eight in the conduction band. Right? Well, because you don't sum up, or zero at the trap and 10 in the conduction band, then doesn't make sense because trap has lower energy. Why it gets nothing? That, right? So that is the reason you have this incomplete ionization. Now then in room temperature, we already have this problem. What happens when we go to cryogenic temperature? We call this carrier freeze out. Well, yeah. So uh, if we adjust the Fermi level so that it's energy, the lowest trap energy, then what? Well, sorry, when I say adjust the Fermi level, it does mean, doesn't mean that you can really adjust the Fermi level for this mean, right? What I'm saying is that the system will automatically have a <laughs> occupation such that the Fermi level is adjusted at the right place. So if you fulfill the Fermi derived mm -hmm. statistics, uh, on one hand, and then the total amount of occupied electrons is summed up to the original number of electrons, right? And that is what determines the Fermi level. That's what I want to say. Oh, okay. Yeah. Control, really <coughs> we cannot control the Fermi level. It just need to, uh, unless it is under long equilibrium, right? When it is under equilibrium, then the Fermi level will need to follow the statistics that I just shown you. Yeah, good. Now, so this is called carrier fees out, right? So this is uh, some experimental data from pretty old 1954, right? Almost 100 years. Uh, but you, what you can see is this. This is one over T. You always see this, so be careful, right? So let me ask you, what is 0 0.04 for one over T? 0 0.04 equal to 1 over t. So t equal to 1 over 0 0.04, which is equals to 25, thank you, 25 Kelvin. Pretty low, right? Still not 3 Kelvin. Here is about 300 Kelvin. So it is opposite, uh, I mean, reciprocal of the temperature. So you see that at high temperature, first of all, at room temperature or high temperature, it's not fully ionized neither. For example, let's look at 1E18. You look, think it's 1E18. Yeah, this is 1E18 at this point. Uh, I think this is like 400 Kelvin. If you look at 300 Kelvin, it does not go to 1E18. Okay, just because it's not fully, fully ionized. But anyway, when we start reducing the temperature, this is log scale again. The number of holes goes down exponentially. So you thought that you have like, this is what, 2E17? This is very good, uh, not a very good conductor, but it's conducting pretty well. But when you cool it down to 25 Kelvin, it's 1E10, basically just an insulator. Uh, this is called carrier freeze out. They are frozen. And it's easy to understand because temperature is low, you cannot jump over this barrier, 45 minute EV. For phosphorus okay so if you have a lower concentration you have you go down faster but when it is large enough it doesn't depend on temperature that is because they're so close to each other they just hop they just do tunneling they don't need to go through the ionization process they form an impurity band right So this is something uh, when people, uh, some people, right, when we were, was not popular, some people think that, wow, how can you use silicon for quantum computing? Uh, you're going to have carrier freeze out. But indeed, it is known that when you have high enough doping, there's no problem for the source and drain, right? Yeah. So the, the impurity band, does that end up acting like just another reduction band? Yeah, you can think in that way, yeah. Uh, you, you can just say that like, I color it, you see I color it as green and continuous, so you can say that it's just like a new conduction band, yeah. But, but in reality, of course, they hybridize. You think of this, right? You cannot really split, uh, distinguish 
when they are really high concentration, what is the original conduction band, what is the new one? They just hybridize and merge, and all these bands are not sharp. You take a look at this Altamas paper, you will see the density of state. You have a pit and they gradually merge. Yeah. 